Let us pray. Our Father, we come to acknowledge your greatness and your power. We worship you because you are the God that created the world in your power, in your glory, and because of your love. We thank you also because of the establishment of your own church, light in darkness, to manifest your love and your grace to humanity. We thank you because of Jesus Christ, who came and died, shed his blood for the remission of our sins. We bless your name because you have brought us into that opportunity and privilege of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for this light in our pathway as we're going toward the heavenly kingdom. Father, we are praying that your grace and your love and your power will keep us faithful unto you all along our journey in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that every time we come here, there will be a part of the truth we didn't know before you reveal unto us. There will be more of your abundant grace to shower upon us. And Father, we pray that there will be more strength and courage and boldness given unto us as we are going on in the journey of life. Father, we pray that between now and the time we see your face, will not lack the grace to live for you. Will not lack the power to stand for you. And as you helped the early church, you will help us through as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Reveal your truth and your mind to us today. And grant us the grace to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight, as it were, we come before the council of priests in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 4, from verse 13 to verse 23, we have the scene before us, the stage before us, as we see our beloved preachers, Peter and John, two of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, stand before the council of priests and rulers of the synagogue, as their question for their faith and for the manifestation of the authority and power of the name of Jesus Christ, which has just wrought a miracle upon a man that was lame and had been lame for 40 years. They were called for questioning. You understand the background. They were just innocently going on the afternoon prayer meeting at 3 o'clock into the temple at Jerusalem, and they went through the um, popular gate, the beautiful gate of that temple. And as they were passing by, they saw the man that had been carried there continually. And they saw that this man was lame, asking for arms. And uh, Peter and John stayed and they stood and looked at the man. And as they looked at him, they told the man, silver and gold we have none. But what we have we give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Let me give you a little background to the story. You see, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had lived a dynamic life, and a challenging life, an exciting life in Israel. And his power had been felt in Nazareth and Capernaum and Galilee and Judea and, uh, you know, all in Israel and particularly in Jerusalem. The chief priests in the synagogue had noticed that this great Jesus was manifesting great power. And the conspiracy grew and uh, the betrayal came and they tried Jesus Christ and they decided Jesus Christ was guilty of blasphemy because he called himself the son of God. Eventually they crucified him. While he hung on the tree, on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And they buried him. In his sepulchre, they laid a great stone, and they made sure that he will not rise from the dead, so that the latter mistake will not be greater than uh, the former mistake or the former error. And therefore, they sealed that stone, but on the third day, an angel came from heaven, and there was a shout of power, and the stone was rolled away, and Jesus rose from the dead. They knew that in Jerusalem, but he silenced those soldiers, and he told the soldiers, you say that his disciples have come, 
and they have carried him away while you were sleeping. And if this comes to the uh, notice of the people in authority, they will just excuse you and there will be no harm to your life at all. And the story came all along in Jerusalem that Jesus Christ, his dead body had been stolen away, but really in essence, in reality, he rose from the dead. But then he appeared to his own disciples and said, Peace be unto you. And then said, All power and all authority is given unto me. Go therefore into all nations and, and teach them, telling them all that have commanded you. And then he told them something before you do that. You wait in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Because not many days hence, if you tarry for that power, you'll be closed with the power of the Almighty God. It says, Ye shall receive power. Another version of the Bible says, You'll be closed with divine ability. And you see, they waited in Jerusalem in the upper room on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The power came upon them and they began to speak in other language, in another tongue, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were amazed in Jerusalem and they, they were astonished and said, What is the meaning of all this? I tell you, that was the beginning of the manifestation of power in Jerusalem. And the disciples were ministering to one another, ministering to the Lord, preaching to the gospel, continually continuing in the temple uh, with one accord and in breaking of bread from house to house. And they did eat their meat with singleness and gladness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. But then as these two uh, men of God, apostles, came into the temple in Jerusalem, they told the man in the power of Christ to rise up. And he did. You know that he was surprised and the people were surprised. And before long, a crowd was gathered before Peter and John. And Peter and John counted that as an opportunity because, you know, actually they were asking the question, why has this happened? And therefore Peter told them, ye men of Israel, why are you surprised at this? Why do you look on us earnestly as though by our own power or holiness who have made this man to walk? And he began telling them, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers who has glorified his son. And he began to talk to them about Jesus Christ, about resurrection resurrection about being born again about giving their lives to the lord jesus christ and he said you know unto you first god having raised up his son jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from all his iniquity you know at that point I told you last week that the priests have been waiting for about three hours because they were waiting their normal calls there are 24 courses of priests and they were waiting for their own turn so that they'll be able to officiate in the prayer meeting. But they saw that the people were not coming in. And as they came out, they saw this large crowd in the temple yard, in the temple court. And it surprised them. Why they were not coming in? Then they listened. They saw that Peter and John were talking about Jesus Christ, about the resurrection from the dead, and about life through Christ, about the need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may be saved. And because of that, they were upset. They became unhappy. The Bible says they were grieved or indignant about it. And they laid hold on the apostles. And he locked them up. They arrested them. Because they felt they were doing something that was unlawful. And then persecution started. As I go into the exposition of verses 13 to 23, I want to talk to you a little bit concerning persecution. Jesus had prepared the minds of his own disciples. Because you must understand, you see, we don't appreciate the persecution in the early church enough. We don't understand as we, as we ought to understand, but let me explain to you. For many, many years, in fact, thousands of years, since the call of Abraham, and uh, since the choice of Isaac, and since the blessing and the selection of uh, Jacob, that the children of Israel are known about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they knew that all of religion culminated in circumcision. 
you were born in Israel, you were circumcised physically, and you have started your life in religion, and then you were handed over the law of Moses, the law concerning sacrifices and ceremonies and rituals. And for thousands of years, this was all that they knew. There was a set or company of priests and uh, Levites that came to explain to them of the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of the Mosaic law. And then later, there were rabbis, rulers in the land, rulers in, in the synagogue that came to explain to them that the only religion, the only faith, the only thing that uh, united a man with God was Judaism or the law of Moses. And they were quietly going on. Whether they were inside Palestine or they were inside the land of Israel or they were in captivity to Assyria or to Babylon, they were carrying on with their religion for thousands of years. But then all of a sudden, somebody appeared. His name is John the Baptist. And he was telling them that the kingdom of God is coming. But at that time, they didn't understand. They felt it was just a re-emphasis of the prophecy of Isaiah. It was just another explanation of the prophecy of Daniel. So the Jews didn't see anything to worry about in the preaching of John the Baptist. Because, you know, he will tell them that this is see of, uh, that Isaiah prophesied about. And therefore, they did, they did not see anything to be alarmed about. And then Jesus Christ came. He was um, baptized in River Jordan. And he started his ministry. And uh, they were still wondering what it was all about. And they, there were many conjectures about Jesus. They felt maybe it was Jeremiah risen from the dead. Or one of the prophets. Or just, you know, just a great man. And in the synagogue, as well as in the streets, they were, uh, they were thinking, they were reasoning. So among them, what's this Jesus doing? We hope it's not going to change the religion we have been, we have been brought, uh, you know, thousands of years. And eventually, Jesus died. And he felt, well, now we can rest because we can now go on in our religion of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and also the Lord Moses. And suddenly, these apostles appeared in town. They had received the power and they had received the dynamic power of God so much that they were going on about healing the sick, preaching the gospel, explaining that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And I tell you, it upset the people in Jerusalem. And uh, you think of, you know, a person bringing in a religion that nobody had ever heard anything about. You see, in Nigeria here, we're enjoying. Because you see, Christianity has been brought for more than 100 years now. So it's no more strange. Almost in every village, in every town, in every state, in Nigeria, you find people reading the Bible. And many people in Nigeria believe that the Bible is the word of God, at least in nominal, at least in nominal sense. But you know, in those days, the people did not know, they didn't understand about Jesus Christ at all, at all. They felt it was blasphemy if you talked about Jesus Christ as the Son of God and as the chief cornerstone of this new religion called Christianity. And it bothered the Israelites so much. And when the Sadducees came, and the captain of the temple, and the priests, when they came, and they saw the people talking, they saw these apostles talking to the people, you know, it shocked them. And they listened to what they were saying, and it was what they counted as blasphemy. That is the reason they persecuted them. But I was about to tell you that Jesus Christ had prepared the minds of his own disciples. He had told them that when new truth comes, it will be a challenge as well as a surprise to the people around. So he told his disciples and apostles, don't be surprised because all you'll be saying, all you'll be living for, all you'll be preaching will be new to the people of Israel. And therefore it is, it is very possible you'll be persecuted. Turn with me to John chapter 15. Verses 18 and 19. If the world hate you, ye you know that it hated, hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world... The world will love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates, 
you remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours. And in First Peter chapter 4, you know, Peter went through it all. He had a social persecution. Because the new face and the new thing he was talking about was misunderstood. And when people misunderstand, they react. And because they misunderstood the message of Peter and John and the rest of the apostles, they reacted against the messages and against them. And Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, tells us, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness and lust and excess of wine and revelings and banquetings and abominable idolatries, which did think it strange that ye run with them to the same excess of ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, then they are speaking evil of you. And Paul tells us in Second Timothy chapter three. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, or yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You see, in those days, because it was all new, you know something right now, in the world right now, we have more than one billion people calling on the name of Jesus Christ. But you know, at that time, it wasn't like that. It was just a small group in the upper room in Jerusalem that were calling on Jesus Christ and saying that Jesus Christ is Lord and Jesus Christ is their Savior. And it was all strange. You think about a new religion that was just coming up and they didn't know about it beyond the borders of uh, Israel. In Egypt, in Babylon, in uh, Rome, and you know, the, the very seat of the world empire. At that time, they knew nothing of, uh, of this Christianity. I mean, at the beginning, when the power fell in the upper room, it was just a small group that came around and they were saying that Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is Savior, His name will save, the power of His name will heal and work miracles. It was all strange. And you think of, uh, you know, this Jesus who had been crucified as a blasphemer. A, a person cr crucified as a criminal. And now these people were coming and they were saying he wasn't criminal. He was even the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And it was a surprise and it was a shocking news to the people in Jerusalem. And that's why they were persecuted, because they were misunderstood, because they were misrepresented. And now Paul was telling the believers, yea or yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know what Paul was saying? He was saying, if you live a moral life but it's not connected with Jesus Christ, you can avoid persecution. You'll, you'll be put up as a moral example in society. But in their own time, he said, if you connect your righteousness, your holiness, your godliness with Jesus Christ, you'll suffer persecution. But let me explain to you, because our, sometimes in the church, we, we, we misunderstand, we don't understand the difference between persecution and punishment. You know, sometimes some people go out and they do things that are foolish. Things that are just wrong and evil and sinful. And they suffer for their sin. And they say, well, I am being punished or I am being persecuted for Christianity. There are times a wife at home uh, can do something naughty, something bad. And then the husband reacts to that. And the wife will mistakenly say, well, I am being persecuted. Or it may be a messenger or a worker in an office that will do something wrong something bad and then he'll suffer for his misbehavior and then he'll say well i'm suffering for christ it's not like that my brother my sister if you sin if you do evil if you misbehave and as a result of that you are suffering that is not persecution it's punishment let's see in the word of god in first peter first peter Chapter 4, verse 15. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer. You hear that? Now, if you suffer as a murderer, you are not suffering as a Christian. You are not being persecuted. You are being punished for your sin. Or as a thief. Or as an evildoer. Or as a busybody in other men's matters. That's punishment for sin. If you do evil and you are being punished and there is reaction against your evil or against, you know, sometimes it's fanaticism. And uh, fanaticism is when you behave in a way that is contrary to the light of the Bible, to the gospel of the word of God, and yet you are thinking that you are being God. When it's only that you are fanatical and evil and sinful and just misbehaving. And it's so, if you suffer as a result of that, uh, that is punishment, not persecution. That's why it says, let none of you, emphatic, as a believer, if you say you are a child of God, let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, as a busy body. And in chapter 2 of First Peter verse 20, for what glory is it if when, we, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? What good, what benefit, what glory comes in when if you are buffeted for your fault, for your evil, for your sin, uh, you take it, uh, ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well and suffer for it ye take it patiently this is acceptable with god and so let's realize the difference between persecution and punishment you do evil you are punished you do you do righteously you do well and you are misunderstood and that is persecution but then before i get into the message really i want to give you seven principles in meeting persecution the Apostle Paul has told us that if we live godly in Christ Jesus, if you are born again and your light is shining and you are a real child of God, that you will suffer persecution. Now the persecution comes in uh, different labels and uh, different categories and uh, different shapes and sizes. Sometimes it's just a neglect from your neighbor. Sometimes is that you are separated from them. Sometimes they abuse you. Sometimes they do something physical. And sometimes it's just a, a social uh, strangulation sort of. You are kicked aside. You are neglected. And nobody wants to reckon with you. And you are reproached or ridiculed in society. And uh, it may come in whatever shape or size. If it's persecution for righteousness, how are you to behave? What's to be your attitude in persecution? I give you seven principles. Come back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Number one, you must be submissive to God and to the people that are persecuting you. You never strike back, you never talk back, you never react, you never abuse, you never pay them back in the coin in which they have paid you. You see, when they laid hands on Peter and John, how did they behave under persecution? How did they react under persecution? They were submissive. Submissive to God, submissive to the people. Acts chapter 4, I'm reading verse 3. And he laid hands on them. And put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tired. Did they shout, grumble, fight, boxed, wrestled? Never. And you see, the attitude you are to have when you are persecuted at home for righteousness, or anywhere for righteousness, neglected by your friends because of righteousness, the attitude you have to manifest is, number one, you are submitted to God. You are saying, well, I don't know what God has in this thing that is happening to me, in the home, in the village, in my vicinity, all around me, but I know that God is working out something good. God is permitting in his wisdom what he could have prevented in his power. And because of that, I will be submissive. Submissive to God and submissive to the people. People, lovingly and graciously bearing that persecution counting it as an opportunity to suffer for Christ in Acts chapter 16 
I'm reading there from verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. The Greek says the, police, the prisoners were listening. Now you see, uh, Paul and Silas at this time had done a wonderful work. A, a lady that was possessed with a spirit of divination had uh, confronted Paul. And she followed them many days and paul sensed to each in the spirit that it was time for her deliverance and told the evil spirit to come out of her but because of the gain that the people had lost they, they took them up and they locked them up and you know what paul and silas did they just submitted to everything and they sang praises unto god from a heart of love, graciously and lovingly, bearing the persecution that came their way. Are you a believer in Christ Jesus, righteous and godly and holy in Christ Jesus? If persecution comes, you have to bear it graciously and lovingly, submitting that this gives you opportunities to suffer for Christ. Look at verse 26. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaking, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Listen to me. Suppose you were, you were suffering persecution, and suddenly the gates of the prison opened and all your chains fell off. What will you have done? Run away. Praise the Lord. The Lord has sent his angel, is broken the prison. And he has manifested his sovereign power. There is no change. Silas, are you still there? Let's get away very quickly. Never. They just kept on. That's what I'm telling you. Submission. Submission. You don't pack away from your husband's house because you are persecuted. You don't drive away your wife because she is misunderstanding you. Uh, you don't run away from your master. Uh, you don't run away from the situation because you're under persecution. You stay right there and you bear it lovingly and graciously because of the will of God. And I even find that there are some church members who run away from the church when they are rebuked for their faults. I doubt whether they are Christians or not. You know, they come to church and they hear a message that rebukes them and chastises them and, you know, scratches them in the place where they hurt or they are corrected for something. And the next thing they do is that, you know, they just run away. But, you know, if you're a real believer, you never run away from the church because of, uh, you know, rebuke or correction. And you don't even run away from the situation outside when you're under persecution as a real believer. That's a true test that whether you're a Christian or not, they remain there. You know something? If Paul and Silas had drawn away at this time, the Philippian jailer will not have been converted. But he stayed there. In fact, if, if they had drawn away, the Philippian jailer would have killed himself because we're told in verse 27, and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. We are submissive to God, to authorities, and to the persecutors. We are all here. We are still all in submission to God, to Christ, to the Holy Ghost, and to the people who are in authority. That's what I'm telling you. The very first thing you notice in persecution is that you are submitted completely. Now, number two. Acts chapter 4. Verse 8. Let me read from verse 7. And when they had sent them in the midst, they asked, By what power, by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Number 2. Be filled with the Holy Ghost, completely yielding to the control of the Holy Spirit throughout the persecution, so that everything you say, will be controlled by the Holy Ghost. Even every thought, every reaction in the persecution will be under the control of the Holy Ghost. That's principle number two. You cannot face persecution on your own. You must lean on a power greater, higher than yourself when you're under persecution. You see, when you're under persecution, you, you, you sometimes become depressed. 
When you're under persecution, you, you sometimes become confused. When you're under persecution, you sometimes are in a crossroad and you don't know which way to go, what to say, how to react, how to respond to the persecutors. And that is the time for you to rely completely and yield completely to the Holy Ghost. That's principle number two. Now number three. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. And now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Principle number three is, you'll be wise and bold. Unshaken in your commitment to Christ and to his word. You know, sometimes if you're afraid before your persecutor, you'll not know what to say. You will not be calm, cool, and collected. And it will appear that you are really guilty for what they are accusing you of. Whereas really it is fear that is closing your mouth. Whereas it is, you know, the fear that is making you to shake. And to, It's not because you are really guilty of what they are saying. But because you are afraid, you, you really do not know what to say. But principle number three under persecution is you remain bold and wise in the Holy Ghost. And you, you remain unshaken in your conviction and in your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the word of God. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. But you sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with reverence, with fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now principle number four, come back to Acts chapter four, verses eight and nine. We need all these principles as we face persecution in our day-to-day -day experience. Uh, as we work out uh, the Christian life in our lives. As we're committed to the Lord and we face challenges and reactions and persecutions, wherever it may be. We need all these principles to be submissive to God and to the people. To be filled with the Holy Ghost, totally yielding to the control of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the persecution, to be bold and to be wise on shaking our commitment to Christ and his word, and then to respect the persecutor, loving them with the love of God and praying for the blessing of God upon them. Acts chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people, you see that respect? Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the important man by what means is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel. You know, there was such a respect in their hearts for the rulers that, one, they didn't talk at the time they shouldn't talk. They talked only at the time they were given opportunity to talk. You know, when you're under persecution and the other man is talking, if he's above you in rank in your office, if he's above you in the home, in authority, your husband is talking to you and you are the wife, he should manifest a quiet spirit. Let him talk. Let him, uh, you know, bring the accusation and let him stop talking and require an answer from you before you ever talk. And when you begin to talk to your husband or to whoever it may be, challenging you or examining you, you do it with all respect and reverence and honor. In Acts chapter 23, Acts chapter 23. I'm reading there from verse 1. Here Paul was under persecution. And Paul honestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. He called them men and brethren. He was before the council and he beheld that council. And he said, Men and brethren, 
you know I'm a, I'm a righteous person in all humility. I submit before you that I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I am not a criminal. I am just, you know, a preacher of the gospel, wanting the people to live better lives and come nearer to God and have Jesus Christ in their lives who can make their lives better and make them better citizens in the community. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. You know, when he made that confession, and he told them that he had a good conscience, he was living a proper life. Now, Ananias, the high priest, said, who told you to talk? Officer, smite him. And, and you know, th this man was a great apostle. He had seen Jesus Christ before. He had heard the word of Jesus before. He had gone to the third heaven. And many miracles had taken place in his life. In fact, handkerchiefs or aprons have been taken away from him to heal the sick and to cast out evil spirits. And now the high priest said, smite him. Verse 3, then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For thou sittest to judge me after the law, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. You are here, you are here convicting me that I'm a lawbreaker, and you are breaking the law yourself. We're right in the council. Where there shall be justice and uh, where the rights of the individual should be given to him. Do, don't you know I know the Roman law as well as the Jewish law and you command me to be smitten contrary to the Roman law and the Jewish law. Now God will smite you. That's what he said. But look at what follows. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, Oh, how sorry I am. I wish not, I know not. Brethren, that he was a high priest. How, how sorry I am. How guilty I have become for what I have said then. I didn't know that that is our high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. You hear that? You know, he repented immediately. He said, I've made a great mistake. Because the word of God said, I must never speak evil of the ruler of the people. And you see, that is what you should manifest under persecution. You never speak evil. You never retaliate. You never fight back. You never react. You only respond in a quiet and simple manner. You show respect and honor and reverence to the people that are misunderstanding and persecuting you. Principle number five. I'm coming back to Acts chapter four. Verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. What's that principle we find there when you're under persecution? You bind yourself closer to the people of God so that you can just draw strength from people of like precious faith as you are. Listen to me. A time of trouble, a time of persecution, a time when you are misunderstood in your neighborhood. It's not a time you separate from the church. It's not a time you, you begin to walk in isolation, alone. A time when you're under persecution from your people, from your parents, from people that misunderstand you. That's a time you bind yourself closer and closer and closer to the people of God. When you're under trial and tribulation, when you're under affliction and sorrow, when you are confronted by troubles that are much more than you can bear, what do you do? You stand closer to the people of God. You bind yourself closer to the people that have like precious faith like you have. They came back to their company. They related all that happened to them. They shared together. Now principle number six. They prayed and they blessed the name of God. Verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. At a time of persecution for you as a child of God, it's a time for prayer. 
personal prayer, corporate, corporate prayer, family prayer, prayer in the church, prayer at home. You just burst yourself with prayer. You close yourself in the strength of the Almighty. You surround yourself with the praying people of the church. When you're under persecution, it's not a time to be talking and gossiping and, you know, just a plain ignorant of the powers of darkness. But it's the time you come nearer God in prayer, personal and collective prayer. And then, principle number seven, you ask God for greater boldness and faithfulness. Acts chapter 4 verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. You, you see, at the time of persecution, it's a time we need if you've got boldness before you pray for more boldness you realize it said in verse 13 when they saw their boldness they took knowledge of them they had been with jesus and now they were praying for more boldness again when you're under persecution under trial under affliction you pray to god for more boldness and for more faithfulness now already i've given you the real study even though i've not read all the verses i'll read the verses to you now and i'll just talk to you about the recognition by the priest the reasoning among the priests the response of the preachers and then the release of the preachers i start from verse 13 acts chapter 4 verse 13 and now when they saw the boldness of peter and john and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men they marveled and they took knowledge of them they recognized them that they had been with jesus and beholding the man which was healed standing with them they could say nothing against it verse 16 saying what shall we do to this man for that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all that dwell in jerusalem and uh, we cannot deny it when it says they took knowledge of them that they had been with jesus now you there are many preachers who spiritualize that and they would think uh, you know uh, they were there and it appears the color of their face the smile in their mouth the you know the reactions and the mildness and everything it's just like jesus christ yes it's all right to be like jesus in your look in your dressing in everything in your voice in your prayer but that's not what he's talking about here when it says they took knowledge of them that they had been with jesus christ mainly or principally they took knowledge of them in three various in three areas they had seen jesus christ they had noted the life of jesus christ and if there was anything that was you know captivating to them in the life of jesus christ there were three major things in the life of jesus number one the interpretation of the old testament jesus was masterful in interpreting old testament you know the rabbis had come and they had corrupted the old testament they had misinterpreted the old testament and whenever jesus christ was confronted he always appealed to the old testament and you look at the sermon on the mount in matthew 5 6 and 7 it's a masterful piece interpreting the old testament and you see jesus christ as he confronted the people and he said why did david say uh, the lord said unto my lord sit thou on my right hand until i make your enemies thy footstool always appealing to the old testament it sometimes told them why did then uh, you know it was written and the god of abraham and isaac and jacob we know that god is not the god of the dead you know every time jesus appealed to the old testament and he interpreted it in a masterful way and you know what they recognized in these apostles they were talking to them and they were asking them questions and they were saying now oh, by what power by what authority by what name have you done this and you know what they did they just went immediately to the old testament and they said this is that which was spoken in the old testament by david the prophet and he said the stone that is rejected by you builders have become the cornerstone and when they saw them interpreting the old testament precisely and pointedly they took knowledge of them they had been with jesus christ not only that whenever jesus spoke whenever he preached he spoke with authority you know it says in matthew chapter 7 
verses 28 and 29 that after Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his saying because he taught them with authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. That's another thing they noticed in the life of Jesus. And you know, at this time when they saw the apostles standing before them, and they just saw them in authority. They, they manifested the same authority as Jesus manifested. They stood authoritatively. They quoted the scriptures authoritatively. And their interpretation was precise and pointed. They took knowledge of them. They had been with Jesus Christ. Not only that. You know, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said, We know. Thou art a teacher come from God. Because no man can work these miracles that were working out except God be with him. They had seen Jesus Christ telling the lame to rise up, opening the eyes of the blind. They had seen Jesus cleansing the lepers. And when they saw the magnitude, think about it, the magnitude of the miracle upon this man, a man that had been lame for 40 years, in fact, born lame, and just in the twinkling of an eye, in an instant of time, they commanded and they said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked. They saw that the magnitude of the miracle was just like the miracles of Jesus Christ. That's why they, they took knowledge of them. The miracle, the authority, the interpretation of the Old Testament. And they saw that they're just like Jesus Christ. They recognize them and they recognize the virtue, the authority, the power, and the glory of God in Christ upon them. Now, let's go to the reasoning among the priests. Acts chapter 4 from verse 15. Now, but when they had commanded them to go aside, out of the council, they conferred among themselves. Again, please, notice. The apostles were still submissive. After they had been filled with the Holy Ghost and they had answered these uh, priests in the council, the Sanhedrin, and, uh, and they had given the, their own understanding uh, by the Holy Ghost into what had really happened, and they had exalted Jesus Christ, saying, There is neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And uh, the, the priests, they heard them, they looked at them, they saw them, they recognized these are the servants of the Most High God in Christ Jesus. They said, go aside for a moment. You know, Peter and John did not resist. They did not say, no, we're not going aside. Let's settle it here and now. Uh, there are some believers that are rude before authority. And they, they do not know the Bible. They read the Bible and they feel that they are being bold. A policeman is, you know, uh, discharging his duty. And he's dis discharging his duty, he tells you, well, park over here. You know, I'm a child of God. Well, if you're a child of God, you'll be obedient to authority. And even when you have, uh, you know, spoken right, and you know that in all ways, they would not have seen anything wrong with you at all. They know that you are just a wonderful member of the society. And they feel, well, okay, we understand what you're saying, but go aside you'll still be submissive to God and, and to the people in authority. So they went aside. And they reasoned among themselves. And how did they reason? Look at verse 16. Saying, what shall we do to these men? It was a conference now in the council. And they, they needed help. They needed help. And they were saying, what shall we do? Really, for indeed, a notable miracle. This one is not a small miracle. This one is a notable miracle. You know, I sat here last Thursday in a false revival miracle hour. Uh, you know, when we talk about miracles, there are notable miracles, spectacular miracles. There are categories of miracles. And if you can, you know, scale them and, you know, just measure them, uh, they're in different classes. And last Thursday, we listened to just notable, spectacular miracles. A man came up here and he said his uh, body had been totally uh, Bunt up with leprosy, the fingers eating up the lips and the nose and, you know, just parts of the body. And he was rotting and smelling before. And he came into this uh, auditorium on a Thursday. And uh, the prayer of faith was prayed. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, think. 
the people in the large auditorium, you didn't hear what I said, did you hear? I'll repeat it, I'll tell you. You know, sometimes the people in the front rows are the people that enjoy. Loudspeaker or no loudspeaker, they say, preacher, preach on, we're hearing what you're saying. I was talking about the notable miracle of, you know, last, uh, last uh, Thursday. That this man's body had been totally eaten or became rotting with leprosy. And he came into this auditorium. And as the man of God was praying here, God is an all-seeing God. God sees us where we are. And, you know, and I said there is a man there with leprosy. And he raised up his hand and we prayed for him. And the leprosy dried up. And uh, when he came here last Thursday, I could see him from where I was sitting. The hands were all right. The legs were all right. Everything was all right. The leprosy had gone. That is a magnificent miracle. A notable miracle. And, uh, you know, many, many miracles. If you read the last uh, miracle and healing news that we, we sent out, uh, many notable miracles that took place. God is still doing it again. And so uh, the priests of the council, they came together and they said, well, <laughs> that uh, a notable miracle had taken place. And it is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth no more to no man in this name. And he called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now the word in the Greek that is uh, written here, speak, is used one other time in the Bible. Sorry, in the New Testament. It was a strong word. They really strictly commanded them not to speak publicly or aloud in the name of Jesus to any man. Now remember, the apostles were under the control of the Holy Ghost. You know there are people that, you know, whenever they are confronted by persecution, whatever they have heard that somebody said before is the same thing they will say they are not under the fresh anointing of the holy ghost but let me tell you something when you're under persecution you cannot say well when they ask john or james or peter or andrew or you know J or janet or uh, josephine that particular question this is what he said or this is what she said you must be under the fresh anointing of the holy ghost to know what to say and so you know at this time the Holy Ghost was still in control. And while the elders and the leaders and the rulers were talking, the Holy Ghost now breathed on them in verse 19. This is the response of the preachers. What did they say? But Peter and John answered and said unto them in unison, in agreement, you know they had no time to rehearse what they were going to say and yet they were so much under the complete uh, control of the holy ghost that they said the same thing at the same time in the same way with the same temper that's what we're saying when you're under persecution if you are really under the holy ghost under his control, under his power, under his authority, and you are really yielded, you'll be saying exactly what the Holy Ghost wants you to say. And you, you'll be saying it with all politeness, and yet you'll be firm in your conviction on the Lord Jesus Christ. All respect, yes, with all um, reverence, yes, oh yes, but with all conviction that you know what you're doing. In verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Now, let me explain that to you. You know, the people did not believe in Jesus, but they believed in God. And you know what Peter and John were saying? They were saying, uh, council members, priests, <laughs> we have a difficulty, help us. Now, here you are on one side, and here God is uh, on one side. We really want to do something. Uh, what do you think we should do? Come to your side and oppose God, or come to the side of God and, uh, you know, disobey you? So, the, the apostles were even putting the council members into difficulties, because these were people who believed in God. 
and they, they loved God in their own way. They respected God in their own way, but they didn't know that Jesus is the very Son of God. And, and so they were saying, well, we like to either obey God or obey you. What shall we do? So Georgie, and then uh, before the council members could counsel them, they said, we cannot but speak the things which we have heard and seen. Now, the release. The Holy Ghost is, uh, you know, putting everything aright. Now they were going to release them. Verse 21. So, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing out they might punish them because of the people, because of the people, because of the people, because of the people. You know something? These church members, these miracle workers, were in good favor with the people of the land. What they did was not in darkness. They had a good relationship with the public. Uh, the problem with some believers is that uh, they do not have a good relationship with the public. They are nuisance on the public. But for the apostles, they were, you know, just, uh, they were counted and rated as the prophets of God, the great men of God by the people. And so it says that because of the people, because all men glorified God for that which was done. You know, the men had been hearing of the miracles. It had been spread abroad. The miracles that God had been doing. Therefore, all the people were just praising God because of the people, because of the apostles. And so the council or the priests and the synagogue did not know what to do with them. For the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed and you know in in jerusalem they were just blasting it all about i don't mean under uh, with a loudspeaker there was no loudspeaker at that time uh, you know some believers if there was no loudspeaker they will not know how to share their faith there were no bosses at that time they didn't get into the bosses and they all started shouting on the top of their voices in the bus uh, you know a miracle is happening uh, with peter and john there was no boss there was no loudspeaker how did they do it then you know quietly but assuredly in their in their corners in their houses in the streets one to one they were telling everybody you know what god is doing god is healing the sea god is working miracles our um leader was telling us just now that we shouldn't uh, put our posters and handbills in government offices and uh, you know you can't go on a government bus or any bus uh, for that matter and just paste your poster there it's not proper and you know some christians will feel well if we cannot shout over the loudspeaker if we cannot uh, paste our posters on uh, government offices how will the people here listen to me uh, the people in the new testament they were not pasting their posters on government buildings they were not shouting over loudspeakers and yet everybody in town heard about it how did they hear very quietly they were sharing their faith and sharing their conviction and sharing the miracles one-to-one -one with their neighbors and that's what we're to do we should not become a nuisance in society and now it says uh, this miracle that had been wrought on this man it was a spectacular notable miracle and they released them but in verse 23 and being let go they went to their own company that's to the apostles and i told you that uh, when you're under persecution you bind yourself closer to the people of God, to people of like precious faith. And he reported all that the chief priests and the elders said unto them. When you're under persecution, let your zona leader know. When you're under persecution, let the area leaders and the house fellowship leaders and the house members, let them know so that you can bind yourself together, pray together, love together, and you can support one another, encourage one another. Now, very important today, I've told you about the seven principles in meeting persecution. Let me remind you again. Be submissive to God. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be wise and bold. Be respectful to the persecutors, loving them. Bind yourself together with the people of God. Pray and bless the Lord and ask God for more boldness and faithfulness. If you live godly, one time or the other, persecution will come. I pray the Lord will give you the grace to stand in Jesus' name. Amen. Rise up and let us pray. Take this principle before God. The seven principles. And tell the Lord 
to give you the grace when you're under persecution. Tell the Lord to give you, uh, you know, the power, the love, the submissiveness, and everything that you need so that you'll be able to face persecution in a New Testament manner. And the Lord will do it. Submitted to God, yielded to God, and yielded to the Holy Ghost. The Lord will do it in your life. Tell the Lord to work out these principles in your life when persecution or misunderstanding.